second time. S-937, a bill to facilitate the expedited review of COVID-19 hate crimes and further purposes. Mr. President, in order to place the bill on the calendar under the provisions of Rule 14, I would object to further proceeding. Objection having been heard, the bill will be placed on the calendar. Now on to my remarks, Mr. President. A week ago, the nation reeled in horror as a deranged gunman shot and killed eight people at three different locations across the Atlanta area. Six of them were Asian American women. Just six days later, another shooting. Ten people shot and killed by a gunman who entered a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Some were customers, some were employees, one was as young as 20, and one as old as 65. One of the victims was merely walking through the parking lot after fixing the coffee machines in a nearby Starbucks, the son of Serbian refugees, the shining hope of his family. One of the fallen was a local police officer, Eric Talley, an 11-year veteran of Boulder Police and a father of seven. You look at each of their faces, young, wise, older, you ache, gone. You think of their families who you don't know. Never will see them again, taken so cruelly, so quickly. Today, flags around the Capitol will remain at half-staff in honor of the victims. And we all grieve with their families. We also grieve with the community of Boulder, the people of Colorado. And we grieve with the people of Georgia and all people across the United States whose lives have been forever marred by the plague of gun violence. COVID-19 is not the only epidemic claiming innocent lives in America. Last year alone, 20,000 Americans were killed by gun violence, the highest number in almost two decades. Most of these incidents never reach the headlines, but we cannot allow ourselves to become numb to their devastation. After one of the most difficult years in American history, we all want our lives and our country to return to normal, but not this normal, oh no. Not the normal that accepts everyday gun violence as a matter of course, an incidental risk to living in these United States of America. We cannot, we must not, accept that as normal. We must not shrink from our moral obligation to act. Two years ago, the Republican leader, then in the majority, promised that this chamber would have a real debate on gun violence in this country. It never happened. Even the former president made some noises about supporting common sense gun safety measures before quickly retreating a result, once again, of bitter, reflexive opposition by the NRA to any progress and fear among so many Republicans of what the NRA might do to them if they spoke truth to power. Well, now we don't have a Republican majority. We have a Democratic one. This time is going to be different. A Democratic majority in the Senate is going to act. I have committed to put legislation to expand background checks on the floor of the Senate. We will debate it. We will vote on it. Just yesterday, my colleague, Senator Durbin, led the Judiciary Committee in hearing from scores of witnesses about proposals to reduce gun violence that, may, that this Senate might take up. I have started the process to make legislation to combat hate crimes against Asian Americans, led by Senators Hirono and Representative Mung in the House, available for action on the floor. I've been told by so many Asians in New York that they're afraid just to walk down the street, something they used to do easily. I've seen the pain and fear in their faces as I've attended the rallies in New York. Make no mistake, under the Democratic majority, the Senate will debate and address the epidemic of gun violence in this country. Now on the Levine nomination. Today, the Senate will confirm the nomination of Rachel Levine, Pennsylvania's top health official, to be the next Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. The Biden administration has brought many historic firsts into its ranks, including the first openly gay cabinet secretary at any agency. The confirmation of Rachel Levine represents another important milestone for the American LGBTQ community. She will be the first openly transgender official ever 
confirmed by the United States Senate. The arc of history is long, but it keeps bending in the direction of justice. As transgender Americans suffer higher rates of abuse, homelessness, and depression than almost every other group, it's important to have national figures like Dr. Levine, who by virtue of being in the public spotlight will help break down barriers of ignorance and of fear. Pennsylvania's political leaders say Dr. Levine has forced people in the state to better understand the transgender community. One state legislator said, quote, she has robbed people of the false premise that they don't know any trans people and therefore don't need to be respectful of trans people. The historic nature of her nomination should not be lost on anyone. But Dr. Levine thoroughly deserves to be confirmed on the strength of her qualifications. Despite several attacks on her gender identity over the past year, Dr. Levine has stayed laser focused on helping the state of Pennsylvania manage and respond to COVID. The quality of her public service is reflected in the fact that she was confirmed not once, not twice, but three times by the Republican-led state Senate to serve as first physician, serve first as physician general and then as health secretary. The U.S. Senate should follow suit today and make Dr. Levine the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. Now, Mr. President, one more issue. I was just over at the Rules Committee hearing. It's the first hearing I attended as Majority Leader because it was about S-1, so important. And there I showed, I, I, I showed my anger and frustration at what Republican legislatures are attempting to do throughout the country. Take away people's right to vote, particularly aimed at people of color. You know, Mr. President, it's a more than 160 years since the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments abolished slavery, but Jim Crow is still with us. When a state says you need a notary public to cast an absentee ballot, it is no different than asking African Americans to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar before they voted. Certainly no different in intent. Deprive them of their right, their constitutional right to vote. And here we have Republican senators making excuses for these vicious and often bigoted deprivations of the right to vote. They say the Constitution, this is a state issue. No, Congress has passed numerous laws dealing with federal voting rights. And in fact, the Constitution explicitly says that Congress has the ability and right to do it. And yet, Republicans who lost the election, instead of doing what we should be doing in a democracy, when you lose, you're supposed to figure out why you lost and win over the voters you didn't, but they will just deprive the voters who voted against them of the right to vote. That is eerily reminiscent of what dictators like Erdogan in Turkey or Orban in Hungary would do. Our Republican Party has sunk so low that the Republican leader is over in the Rules Committee defending these actions by state legislatures. I asked him and all the Republicans to give us a reason. Why did the Georgia legislature only pick Sundays to say there should be no early voting on Sunday? We know why. It's because that's the day African Americans vote in the souls to the poll operation, where they go from church to vote. It's despicable. Whenever time, every time you think the country has moved a long way, you see steps taken backward. And let's make no mistake about it, the shadow of Donald Trump, his big lie, his incessant focus on doing anything that benefits him, no matter if it's, if it's the truth or not, if it's constitutional or not, if it's racist or not, has now fallen over this party, and they're not even standing up to protect the sacred right to vote. Shame, shame, shame on all of them. Shame. How can you defend these actions throughout legislatures, which the Washington Post could amount to tens of millions of people losing their right to vote. Are we a democracy? Are we? The shadow of Donald Trump falls dark and large over this caucus when they act like that. 
and it happens far too often. We will not let this stand. We will not let this stand. S1 will pass this body. I yield the floor. The absence of a quorum. We'll call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. 